My name is Heather West. I'm a third year joint degree here between the School of Management and the School of Forestry. Um, and I am, on behalf of CBAE, the Center for Business and the Environment and Capital Institute, really excited to welcome you to this event, uh, the launch of John Fullerton's white paper, Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape Our New Economy. Um, we also have an audience on live stream today, so there's a um, another set of ears listening, so I'll just go over our, our agenda for the day really quick. Um, John will be speaking for about 25-30 minutes, um, and then we'll invite Vincent Stanley up uh, for a response, and then John and Vincent will kind of have a dialogue, and then we're going to open it up to just those in the audience here in Evans Hall um, for a discussion. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to take questions for those of you that are on the live stream link. And for those of you in the room, uh, just remember to hold the button down when you're asking a question and then take your hand off the button when you're done asking a question. And I'll remind you of that as well. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, John and Vincent. John Fullerton is the founder and president of Capital Institute and a recognized new economy thought leader and public speaker. He is also an active impact investor through Level 3 Capital Advisors. Previously, in a former life, <laughs> he was a managing director for JP Morgan, where he managed multiple capital markets and derivatives businesses around the globe and then ran the venture investment activity of Lab Morgan as chief investment officer. John served as JP Morgan's representative on the Long-Term Capital Management Oversight Committee in the late 90s. He was also co-founder and director of Grasslands LLC, a holistic ranch management company with the Savory Institute, a director of New Day Farms, and an advisor to Harmonia. In spring 2014, John was honored to receive a nomination to the Club of Rome, and he is now a full member. He also is the creator of Future of Finance and has appeared and spoken at a number of different uh, well-known news media outlets. He has an MBA from the Stern School of New York University and a BA in economics from the University of Michigan. We're also joined today by Vincent Stanley, who is the co-author with Yvonne Chouinard of The Responsible Company. And he has been in, with Patagonia on and off since the beginning of 1973. For many of those years, he held key executive roles as head of sales or marketing. More informally, he is, or perhaps more importantly, he is Patagonia's chief storyteller. He helped develop the Footprint Chronicles that we all know and love. Um, that's the company's interactive website that outlines the social and environmental impact of its products. He currently serves as the company's director of philosophy and is a visiting fellow here at the Yale School of Management. He is also a poet whose work has appeared in Best American Poetry. He and his wife, Nora, who joins us today, live in Santa Barbara. And with that, I'd like to turn over the floor to John. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Heather. Um, and it's great to be with you all here today. Boy, what an amazing building this is. I'm told that night it lights up in blue, and it's even, even more fascinating. So it's, it's really a privilege to be here with you. Um, and I want to thank uh, Heather in particular for making this all happen. Um, uh, Vincent and I had a dinner not that long ago where the idea came up, why don't you present this at Yale? And then um, it couldn't have been two months ago. Uh, a whole lot of activity happened, um, and with Brad's support and, and Heather and, and Jen and the whole crew here, it all came together in remarkable time. So thank you very much, and uh, it means a lot to me to be here. <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome the people that are listening in virtually, and, and in particular welcome the people that have traveled to get here. I just met uh, some people that came up from New Jersey, so um, that's really, really kind of you. Um, I've been working, I'm also particularly pleased to be addressing the, uh, the Center for Business and Environment. I've been working on the edge of these two disciplines for over a decade now. And I've been working on this paper for over two years. You're sitting on the elephant in the room issue that we must address. Our current economy is destroying the planet, the very basis of civilization, because there's a profit in it. 
How we manage this issue will literally define our legacy on this earth. Most of you understand we have a problem. Welcome to the Anthropocene. The new geological era where man's choices will literally determine the outcome of the entire planet. This is new, and we're messing it up. We live in a time of interconnected crises, economic, social, and ecological. They're systemic. You intuit that capitalism, as we now know it, is in question. Your skepticism about whether our leaders are in control is well-founded. Yet if you're like me, you appreciate the many strengths of our free enterprise capitalist system. You're not interested in throwing it all away in search of some utopian dream that you know in your gut is naive. But you believe there's a better way and we need to find it urgently. My hope is that the framework I'm calling regenerative capitalism will provide the vital roadmap we need to help us find that better way, a pathway to the next stage of capitalism, it provides a framework for a new story, one that is aligned with how the universe actually works. What's crystal clear to me is that you are the heroes of this new story. This needs to be your story, and my generation had better adopt or get out of the way. I kind of stumbled into this question, the question of how to fix capitalism, so that it works for the people and the planet. And a related question, what is the purpose of capital? I left J.P. Morgan in 2001, soon after the merger with Chase Manhattan. I didn't really have a, a clear plan. I just knew that the culture was changing, the culture that I cherished so much, and that I had grown anxious uh, in what I was doing, and so I decided to take some time off. <clears throat> soon after that, 9-11 happened. And I came home to my family and looked my kids in the eyes, who are not much younger than those of you in this room uh, at this time, and I knew I couldn't really explain to them the world they were growing up in. So I went into a fairly deep introspective period, and I started reading a lot of books. I read books that bankers don't read. I read The Limits to Growth. I read E.F. Schumacher. I read Herman Daly, and many, many more books, some um, uh, quite philosophical. And I came to this understanding that the economic system is actually the root cause of the ecological crisis, and that finance is what drives the economic system. So as a 20-year finance veteran hotshot, I had some uh, rethinking to do. And, um, and really, it was out of that rolling epiphany that uh, this paper was born. And this paper was very much uh, a collaborative effort. Um, there in the, in the uh, in the paper, there's an acknowledgment section that lists only some of the, the key people that I've been working with. There are many more. And so in many ways, this is really a synthesis of my own learning. Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe some new ideas uh, looked at through my lens as a finance person, but it's mostly a synthesis of what we already know. And yet it's remarkably in conflict with the way we actually run the world. So I'm taking you on the results of this roughly 10-year journey learning journey with me, and I hope, you'll, uh, hope you'll, you'll stick with it. I'm going to talk today about theory. Now, I'm a practical person, a banker and an investor by training. I have no innate love for theoretical debates. But every once in a while, <clears throat> whenever, every once in a while, um, theory really matters. Theory matters when things are in great change. And right now, we're in great change. And I believe now is one of those times when theory really matters. This shift in paradigm, our search for a new story, is way bigger than the age-old question of capitalism versus socialism, or free markets versus government regulation, or the story playing out in Europe right now about deficit spending versus austerity. This shift is about a new way to think, systems thinking. It may be as big as the Copernican shift, Copernicus, as you will remember, challenged the Earth-centric paradigm and offered his new theory that the Earth actually revolved around the Sun and not the other way around. The Enlightenment was born. It was, a very, threatening, it was very threatening to the high priests of the church at the time 
scientific logic would usurp the power of the church. In a similar way, I believe thinking in systems, integral thinking, will revolutionize every field of study, from medicine to management to urban planning, political governance and the law, and yes, most certainly to economics and finance. Before we turn to this new story, let us briefly confront reality head on. And I'll summarize this in three quick charts. We're in ecological overshoot. No doubt you've learned about this in your classes. The scientists from Footprint Network estimate that we're using 1.5 times the Earth's natural regenerative capacity. That's like having a savings account that earns 10%, earns 10% wouldn't that be nice, and spending 15% every year. Obviously, that can't go on forever. And a more granular representation of this issue can be found in Johan Rockström's Planetary Boundaries Framework, which I highly recommend. We're in ecological overshoot. Next, let's look at our economic crisis and our flawed goal of GNP growth. What this chart says, this, this shows the difference between GDP growth and the genuine progress indicator in blue. And what this says is that our assumption that prosperity comes from GDP growth in a developed economy is flawed. Now, rarely is this addressed by mainstream economists or politicians or business leaders. More typically, it's ignored. So what I'm saying is that the core assumption of how we generate our prosperity no longer works. And of course, there are profound social crises around the world from human rights violations to extreme inequality, all the way to terrorism and war, all rooted, at least in part, in my view, in a broken economic system. These visuals describe a complex web of interconnected macro crises rooted in our broken economics. It's unsustainable. It can only be resolved through sy systemic shifts. Otherwise, we're, we're in a losing game of reacting to accelerating crises de jour, this feels, like what happened, this feels like what's happening today to me. The most important point I will make today is this. For 500 years, we have perfected the skill of analytical problem solving. We break down what's complicated into component parts. We optimize. But in doing so, we lose sight of the whole. That's when we get in trouble. And we're in trouble. Regenerative capitalism is radical in the literal sense of the word, as in getting to the root of the issue. It represents a huge challenge to business as usual. But anything less is simply not a credible response to the immense challenges we face. I believe this integral or holistic approach is not only realistic, it is already emergent in the world. Your study of ecology provides a vital clue to how this works. It's all around us, even if we don't fully recognize it. It's the difference between Western and Eastern medicine. The goal is integrated medicine, building on the best of both. In that sense, we're searching for an integrated economics and finance. We write about it in our field guide. I've invested in it. It's real, but still very fragile. It takes a new theory to help us see it and to know how to measure it empirically so we can manage it and then we can scale it up. If we are to avoid a major systemic collapse, the leaders of tomorrow will need to think in systems. I'd bet my life on that. So what is a regenerative economy? The answer starts with a simple premise. There are universal principles and patterns that govern healthy, complex systems throughout the real world. They apply to living systems, such as our bodies and entire ecosystems, but also to non-living systems, such as the internet. Human economies embedded in society are another example of such complex systems. Our challenge is to bring our economics and finance into alignment with these universal principles and patterns. Alternatively, someone needs to make the case why these principles don't apply to us and our human economy, or that the principles are wrong. I invite you to go to our field guide on our website, where we have now 25 stories of projects that have tapped into this regenerative potential that exists all around us, waiting to be activated. Remember this key point. 
These principles overlap and work as a pattern. It's not an a la carte menu that we can pick and choose from. We must learn to think and manage in patterns. The first principle is in right relationship. This starts at a very macro level. What this chart on the, on the screen now shows is the way the world looks through my eyes as a finance person. Economic efficiency is created by finance optimizing the return on capital in the economy, which then extracts and uses resources from the planet. Those resources are raw materials as well as labor. Something's wrong with this picture. It's exactly inverted from what it needs to be. When we have an economy that's in right relationship, finance will be understood as a subsystem of economics, not the lord of economics. And the economy will be understood as being embedded in society, which in turn is embedded in the planet. There's no such thing as environmental issues. We are part of the environment. Relationships are an important as relationships are as important as parts. How our muscles work with our nerves, for example. Collaboration is smarter than competition. Life is a team sport, is what Janine Benyus, biomimicry expert, likes to say. Contrast this principle with how our capital markets work. We disaggregate risks in the derivatives world into their component parts and manage them separately. We securitize risks and bundle them into packages and then resell them and we wonder why it didn't end well. Short-termism is a huge problem in our capital markets, where we've disaggregated the relationship of real investors and real enterprises. We need to reconnect investors with enterprise, and this is happening in emergent relation relationship banking activities, such as what's done by RSF Social Finance. Um, we need to develop what we call evergreen direct investing ideas to reconnect institutional capital with large enterprises. And this is what, basically what Warren Buffett does. This is not a radical idea in itself. The next principle is holistic wealth. Now, I'm sure much um, uh, discussion has occurred here about measuring the multiple forms of capital. This is now, this is now a topic. There is tremendous work being done by the International Integrated Reporting Committee, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board, the Integrated, Framing, Integrated Reporting Framework, all pushing for standards to measure not just financial wealth, but multiple kinds of wealth. This slide shows uh, one view on this from some people in the permaculture community. There's probably an unlimited amount of categories one could put uh, around the different forms of wealth. The point is, that optimizing for financial capital alone is in violation of this principle of being hol of holistic wealth as opposed to um, uh, reductionist wealth. And optimizing shareholder value is not aligned with this universal principle at all. No wonder there's a move towards stakeholder capitalism. This is evidenced by leaders such as Patagonia and now the entire B Corp movement to name and codify best practices, even creating a new clear legal framework for it. <clears throat> the third principle is innovative, adoptive, adaptive, and responsive. <clears throat> Few will question that innovation and adaptability are essential for health in a rapidly changing environment. Entrepreneurship, unlocking the potential of human agency to create anew across all fields, is inherently regenerative. This has particular relevance to our large bureaucratic businesses and government entities. Adoptive, adaptive management is the future, not command and control. Empowered participation is the fourth principle. All parts must be empowered to negotiate their fair share in order that they can contribute to the health of the whole. So for example, if your toes don't access oxygen, if they don't have enough power to access oxygen in your own body, your feet will atrophy and you won't be able to walk and you won't be healthy. This works in any, in any system the same way. <clears throat> Ownership is a big deal in this issue of empowered participation. And there's tremendous interest now in the new economy movement for alternative forms of, of ownership, such as cooperatives. The Mondragon Cooperative 
in Spain now represents over 12 billion euros in sales with 75,000 employees across over 250 businesses. This is not a fledgling uh, idea. This principle is also, inform also informs the quality circles in Japan dating back to the 1960s and all the way back to the Greeks' invention of democracy and our own Bill of Rights. It also believe, uh, provides, I believe, a new lens to examine the horrific decision of Citizens United. And finally, empowered participation offers a new way to think about the inequality crisis. <clears throat> it aligns with our humanistic and moral desires for a less unequal distribution of wealth and the empirical science of regenerative health. The science is quite clear that extreme inequality harms all participants in a system, even the wealthy. This should change the nature of the debate we're having about inequality. And you can see on this chart, there's a direct correlation between high inequality on the right and worse health and welfare outcomes uh, on the y-axis. And you can see the United States is way up on the upper right-hand corner, not where you want to be. As one of the most unequal, but also uh, having the highest um, uh, readings on these uh, health and social problem indicators. The fifth principle, bear with me, is honors community in place. There's a tremendous interest, of course, in the concept of relocalizing. Farmers markets kicked it off, and now there's an organization called Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. It's now a thing, and this is a response to globalization gone too far a yearning to reconnect to community and place, in right relationship, of course. This principle creates a tension that all global enterprises must tackle head on. It demands a more intricate structure to ensure connection to place. There's one clear conclusion from this. There are natural limits in any system to globalization or in our economic system. And there are natural limits to economies of scale. And we're already seeing this in the real world. The sixth principle, edge effect abundance. I'm sure you've learned this in your um, environmental classes. <clears throat> I have a quote here from Bill Reed, who's sitting with us today. Um, in nature, life happens on the edges, like an estuary where it meets the river, like an estuary where a river meets the ocean. We find our field guide stories, for example, in the manufacturing renaissance and in Detroit Kitchen Connect, that great creativity and opportunity but also tension arises at the edges. For example, between the private sector, the public sector, and the education sectors. The edge between business finance and the environment is where you all have chosen to study. Wise choice. All the edges between our educational silos are fertile ground, and they extend beyond the walls of the academy. But no two edges are also where danger lurks. The seventh <clears throat> principle is robust circulatory flow. Healthy circulation is fundamental to, for any system, living and non-living. This applies to natural resources, materials and energy, but also to information and, of course, to money. All the important interest in closed-loop circular economy, business models, and energy efficiency is further evidence that this principle is already a, at work in the real world. But so, too, Google's success as a company is derived from their unparalleled innovation accelerating the circulation of information. The efficiency-driven consolidation of banking, coupled with, <clears throat> excuse me, coupled with the loss of ethics, has had a highly destructive impact on the healthy circulation of money to all levels of the economy. This is in sharp contrast with one of our stories about the Bendigo Bank in Australia, who has done a tremendous job in a very innovative model, uh, accelerating the circulation of credit into the underbanked communities that they serve. And finally, finally, uh, the eighth principle is in balance. Systems need to seek balance. We know intuitively from our yoga classes that balance is vital. It turns out that this can be proven empirically in living systems. <clears throat> This chart shows the relationship between uh, greater resiliency on the left and greater efficiency on the right. And it turns out that uh, living systems that are vital balance these two. 
Now, when I first saw this, it really struck me because, of course, economics is all about optimizing efficiency. And it's no wonder that if we have a system that's designed to optimize efficiency, pushing us further and further to the right, eventually the system becomes brittle and collapses. And there are numerous other things that need to be balanced, like big and little. We need a, we need a, uh, the answer is not big is bad. The answer is that we need a balance of big, medium, and small. We need to balance flexibility and constraint, diversity and coherence. All of these can be measured now uh, using relatively simple analytics. <clears throat> My suggestion is simple. Align our economy with these eight principles instead of the relentless pursuit at all costs of GDP growth and shareholder value. By doing so, we are more likely to achieve the outcomes we are looking for and generally agree upon. They are the outcomes that only a healthy regenerative system can deliver. This is another adoption of, of a Bill Reed slide um, uh, from the Regenesis group. Their work is primarily focused on living uh, real estate projects and, and community projects. Regenerative real estate is now actually at the cutting edge of this whole field of regenerative thinking. What this picture shows is that as we move from business as usual on the lower left, degenerative, that is, toward the right, we first head into green, which is really less bad, but it's still unsustainable. And that's generally where we are today with our transition of our, of our economy. We're greening the economy, but less bad will not cut it. Only by aligning with the eight principles, all related in a pattern, can we push above the line to a restorative and finally regenerative system. And when we do, we will get sustainability as an outcome, like our bodies are sustainable because we are regenerating our cells every seven years on average. It's the regenerative process that's the key. I've experienced this regenerative process in action in two of my investment initiatives. One involves the holistic management of the grasslands. One involves regenerative real estate development. In each instance, we enhance, we literally enhance ecological wealth and social wealth and, yes, economic value creation. It's quite beautiful, actually. There are implications for public policy. First, we need to get clear on these universal principles <clears throat> that are grounded in both scientific rigor and common sense. They are not political or ideological. They are real. My hope is that they can help us to finally transcend the division that now defines the political process in the United States. They will help us move forward to debate the real issues of how best to foster widespread well-being through a regenerative economy. Much work lies ahead in educating leaders in government, business, and finance from both sides of the political spectrum, educating to think in systems, regenerative systems. System scientists are now developing metrics to measure these principles in real economies. For example, we can measure circulation, and we can measure system balance, as I mentioned. We can even measure, to some degree, non-financial wealth. I was in China recently, where Sanya City unveiled the first natural capital balance sheet of any major municipal government in the world. It's happening. We will need to use our non-analytical judgment, dare I say our wisdom as well. Our forgotten wisdom, modern and indigenous, has never been more important. And of course, there are tremendous implications for finance. <clears throat> it will tell us empirically what is a too big to fail bank. thinking. So we are already moving in the right direction, albeit too timidly. Real asset owners like pension funds need to reconnect in right relationship debt for everything from McMansions to LBOs and hedge fund speculation makes no sense in a regenerative framework, and on and on.
It may seem arrogant to, us to presume that we live in historic times, that this is a new Copernican moment. I've considered this a lot. What are the chances? I've come to believe that, yes, indeed, we do live at a once in a science of the Enlightenment, and also aligned with our humani humanistic values and the core insights of our great wisdom traditions, which are remarkably aligned with this new science as well, yet in conflict with our economics and finance. This new story will require a shift from relying exclusively on reductionist problem solving to holistic or systems thinking. This is very hard. But we now understand the principles and patterns that describe all systems in the cosmos. This must be our new roadmap, and we're beginning to know how to measure them in the real world, often with surprising simplicity once we have the data. So we can learn to manage the system in alignment with the principles. I've attempted to illuminate them in eight principles, and importantly, their pattern and relationship with one another. All and more of these are vital to systemic health, and we are only as healthy as our weakest link. Try running a marathon with a broken toe. Our challenge is to realign our economic system with these universal principles. Keep what works from conventional economics, but confront head-on the flawed assumptions. Money is not wealth. Exponential growth of material throughput in the economy, ever more resources in, ever more waste out, will end. Not all resources are substitutable with financial capital, like water, for example. And we'll never know the true price of externalities until it's too late. Nowhere will this shift be harder than in finance, trust me. It will require a shift in consciousness, really. I see evidence of this already all around us. The former governor of Massachusetts just went to Bain Capital to launch an impact investment fund. I wouldn't have guessed that five years ago. No doubt the shift in finance will require both carrots and sticks, and perhaps some clubs. Our calling and our shared purpose will be, <clears throat> whether we like it or not, to lead this historic shift to regenerative civilization. I say that full, full well knowing the real world tension involved in needing to live in this world that is, while at the same time, catalyzing the change to what is emerging. It's tough. As I said, life happens on the edges, and danger exists on the edges. My wish for you, and for all of us, is for your generation to show us how to dance on that edge. Your genius must be to dance on that edge. I'm here to help any way I can. Let's dance. Thank you. Would you like to join us or come up? I, I promised to uh, uh, John that I would uh, make a response, but this will not be like the uh, the State of the Union speech, with the <laughs> with the uh, the response from the fireplace, uh, the man the the man or the woman in front of the fireplace. I, I'm I'm so struck as um, someone who has worked in a a business for the past 42 years by the uh, uh, the depth of the work you've done, um, and also as someone who's also come from the outside to try to look at these questions, I, I, I regard, I have all the admiration in the world that you came from banking uh, and went through this work for the past 10 years to put together this very complex and uh, extraordinarily uh, rich paper. So thank you for that. I really have only a few, a few things, comments to make. One, one is, um, we're engaged at Patagonia in a project that plays off um, something that John has invested in called the, uh, the Grasslands Project. We're engaged with a group of farmers in uh, Patagonia who are uh, raising sheep for uh, wool that we use in underwear. 
And um, the interesting thing about these farmers, first of all, this is my favorite project in Patagonia. <laughs> and we call it the Holy Grail because it does three things. Um, the first is that these, these farmers, go back again, these farmers all came over, their ancestors came over in a single boat in 1865 from Wales. Uh, they're celebrating their 150th anniversary in Patagonia. They all speak uh, uh, Spanish with a Welsh accent 150 years later. <laughs> and they were all about to go out of business because um, they and other ranchers in Patagonia, Argentina, had been overgrazing the land for 150 years, and uh, it was just about gone. They've been engaged with uh, uh, a project, the Nature Conservancy is, is a partner, Ovis 21 in California, of actually uh, uh, re regenerative grazing, of moving the sheep around in such a way that actually restores the grassland. So at Patagonia, what we're trying to do almost all of the time is trying to reduce environmental harm the environmental harm we do as a company. We recognize that everything we do actually takes back more from the planet than we can replace. But in this project, we can actually be restorative. We can be regenerative. So that's point number one. Point number two is we're keeping a way of life alive that would otherwise disappear. Because one of the things that's happening if uh, monocultures uh, weaken natural systems, I think there's also something about human monocultures that also weaken our own social systems. There is uh, a health to be found in diversity. So keeping a way of life around, uh, alive is number two. And number three is we're actually getting a finer micron wool. We're getting a better wool than we've ever seen, so we're able to make a product uh, that's better than before. So as a business goal, that's, that's extraordinary, that combination of all three. Also, John, in the paper mentioned, not, <clears throat> not in this talk today, but the work of uh, Wangari Mathai, uh, and that the simple act of planting trees in Africa was much more than just planting trees, because it also uh, gave uh, the women of the community uh, standing. It helped restore the communities in which this activity was done. So I think we have to keep in mind, I guess the, 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 the question that I, I want to engage with John when we sit down to talk is, what is it we're trying to regenerate? And we are talking in three levels. We're talking about regenerating a, an economy that is um, in decline and very sluggish. We're talking about uh, regenerating human systems that are at best really frayed at the moment. And, uh, and we're also talking about allowing the planet in many ways to regenerate itself because there's not much that we can do as human beings except to do our best to get out of the way and to learn what it is to get out of the way to allow nature to regenerate itself. So I think with that, I think we should maybe, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, grassland story is very much um, uh, what first set me on this regenerative path. Huh. And in many ways, I thought if, if we can manage grasslands in a regenerative way, both at an ecological level and a social level, as well as a financial level, why can't we learn to manage economies in a regenerative way? That's very much what... Um, I, I actually left out the most important part of that story, which is uh, we went down and filmed these ranchers, and there was one who is the most extraordinary quote. He says, all my life I've thought of myself as a, a sheep farm, a sheep rancher. He says, now I know I'm a grass farmer. I, because he knows that his way of living depends on his capacity for the grass to live. Right. So, so we wanted to open this up and involve you all in the, in the discussion. So 
Questions are welcome, but more comments and contributions are even better. So, sir. Um, my name is Yoni Land. I'm a second year MBA student at the School of Management. Um, and I love uh, your call for us to dance on the edge. Uh, and I love that you uh, coming to Yale. I feel like we are definitely sort of have one foot in the mainstream. Um, and so it's, it's interesting. Um, to hear that call, I'm wondering, the only, the only kind of reasonable way I can think of compelling people in the mainstream to listen is regulation. Um, just think, considering kind of any sector, the sort of, you know, let's take food. Um, to get to scale, you commodify food, right? You need efficiency. And so to include any kind of concerns for the environment, other than kind of marketing. Marketing wise, it feels like just like you need some policy kind of, there needs to be some teeth. Um, I wonder, this doesn't feel like a kind of very policy focused philosophy, so I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. So, so it's a great question. Um, and you know, I have a, um, a love-hate relationship with regulation. Um, usually it causes more problems than it fixes. And it's in part because we think about it in a reductionist way as opposed to a holistic way. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for some firm no's and guardrails, um, but I think we need to rethink industry by industry how we set the rules using this holistic way of thinking or we'll just create more problems. Yeah. You would disagree? No. I, I think one of the problems with, well, um, the challenge of regulation is that you, is that you develop a, a sclerotic system because you get an industry defending itself and a government attacking and neither is really looking at the best interests of everyone as a whole in that situation. They're, 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 defending, they're defending or attacking a particular uh, system. Um, it's one of the odd things about uh, metrics for, for me and, and the, whole, the whole question about measurement, it goes all the way into our, our, our current education system because what a social scientist will tell you that once you, once you make a measurement the goal, it's no longer a measurement. So it's kind of all of these things are kind of the enemy of a more holistic point of view. And at the same time, I mean, we make we deal with organic cotton, and organic cotton has to be certified. And organic cotton is certified to certain rules that, when you look at it on the on the very basis of it, may some of them may seem absurd. But you do need a certification system so that everybody trusts it. The other question that you raise about scale is that it's not always true that large enterprises can um, crush out. Uh, uh, the kinds of smaller activities that can be developed on a on a on a different scale. That, you know, I, I think there's there's been a lot of question about the, the sort of edge activities or edge businesses or smaller businesses. Can they be scalable? And I think there a lot of them shouldn't be. There should be a place for. I mean, if you there's a, there's an association called Hanokians of of uh, companies in the world that are more than 200 years old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are inns and uh, small family businesses that never, that never scaled, but they have a long lasting quality. So, Bill. Can I make a comment on that? Please. The, uh, oh. Thanks. Um, uh, Bill Reed here. The idea of regulation, it's not an either or issue, of course, and it depends on development, but we find in this work that um, meaning, if you can actually find and identify what is meaningful to a dominant group of people, even a subgroup, or if you will, how they fall in love with life again, uh, it is much more powerful than any regulation. Other thoughts? Questions? <clears throat> Yeah. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, I'm a second year in the joint degree program between the, um, the forestry school and the business school. My name is Sarah. Um, 
Uh, I'm curious, uh, coming from finance, um, I mean, you took us kind of a little bit on your journey of how you started to understand this issue. Um, uh, and, and of course, you have a much more in-depth understanding of it. But I'm, I'm curious how you suggest um, you commu that this idea be communicated to people in the finance world now. Um, uh, and and, and what, what level do you think they need to understand it to actually change their actions? Tough question. Um, I think, um, first of all, this is extremely difficult to communicate to anybody because we're all trapped. It's in our DNA to think in this reductionist frame. And so, um, and I'm still learning this. Every time I go for a walk with Alan Savory, I learn new stuff. Um, so I, I, I don't have a good answer to your question. I think the, um, the place to probably start in the financial industry is with the regulators. Because um, if the regulators, and, and some of them are actually starting to think in systems. Um, there's a terrific guy at the Bank of England that is, th this talk would not shock at all. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the challenge of changing the way super aggressive, driven, young, male whippersnappers think is just probably unrealistic. So what I do think we need to do in the financial system is figure out the right kind of guardrails to make the system both safe for, for the economy and for society, and then secondly, more, in aligned, more aligned with what we need finance to actually do. And, um, and it's happening individual by individual. There are more and more people kind of coming over the wall, so to speak. Um, but I, you know, that's a case where we do need a firm hand on the regulatory levers. Uh, we need much clearer incentives that align with the right things. And these are happening, as I mentioned. The, you know, there's now a surplus charge for these systemically important banks, surplus capital charge. That gives big, big, big complex banks an incentive to get less complex and smaller. That's the kind of regulata regulatory structure we need. Um, but this is a huge, huge challenge, and I don't have an easy answer. One thing that, um, that might emerge over the next 5, 10, 15 years is that there will be a lot more businesses who are actually taking advantage of, of some of these ideas to produce products that actually disrupt markets, that help, that uh, what might attract financiers. So, so that may be another way in which uh, uh, the financial world is drawn in. Yeah. I mean, Tim McDonald's, who's here in the back, came up with this idea of evergreen direct investing. And there is a gigantic business opportunity, meaning trillions of market cap of enterprise value, to shift institutional capital from essentially speculating in stocks into direct principal ownership positions in big mature enterprises. And for the entrepreneurs, financial entrepreneurs to figure that one out, it's going to reinvent finance. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen in the next five years or 15 years, um, but we're working hard to cause that to, cause that to happen. So your point's great. There's, you know, when we're stuck in this rigidity of a broken system, you know, that creates huge opportunity, and, and, um, and that will be in, in finance as well. And, and just to reiterate one other point, I mean, Bain Capital just started an impact investment fund. You know, that never would have been, I mean, when I first started doing what we call impact investing, I was still at Morgan. I invested in Edison Schools, charter school management company in 1997. And getting that investment approved by our investment committee was like crazy. <clears throat> um, but now, Bain Capital has decided to hire the former governor of the state of Massachusetts and launch an impact investment fund. So, you know, things are moving. Yeah. Hi, I'm Logan. I'm also a joint degree student between the School of Management and Forestry. And my question is surrounding sort of this tension between wanting to bring more private or mainstream investors into this regenerative capital mentality, but there not being enough investment products necessarily yeah. that fit this uh, model of what you're saying, direct sort of um, taking on, bearing the entire risk, et cetera, et cetera. So sort of like the role that derivatives and secondary markets will continue to play in sort of attracting investors to the space, but also recognizing that there needs to be continuous um, evolution and, and offerings and other investment 
products, I guess. And so the question is about the tension between Yeah, us? just yeah. sort of as we evolve the financial system, we don't really have enough, I, I guess, an opportunity for these um, regenerative yeah. investment, direct kind of investment opportunities. And so there needs to still be a reliance on somewhat even derivatives or um, ways to, that are more diversified risk um, yeah. investment approaches. Well, I, you know, I, I, um, there's nothing inherently wrong with derivatives. It's, there are tools that have great useful purposes Unfortunately, they were massively misused and abused on a scale that shocked me. Um, but, but they fundamentally are a sound tool. Um, I think the issue of, of innovative enterprises, call them regenerative, call them whatever you want to call them, getting access to capital is a, is a challenge. Um, uh, no, no one, there's no, there's no easy solution to that, but even there, you know, there is a growing field of what we now call ourselves impact investors that are looking specifically for innovative business models in businesses that do more than just make a profit. Um, and there's large pools of capital now coming into the field. Um, and so I think it's going to get easier, which doesn't mean it's easy. Um, but I, I don't really see a tension there. I just see it taking longer than we'd all like. Um, but the, you know, the old way, I mean, the, the returns to derivative speculative trading um, are much lower than they were 10 years ago. Um, so the, you know, that, that we've sort of gone through that phase and, um, and it needs to be properly regulated. But the, um, you know, these new emerging growth companies, you know, there's what now, a thousand B Corps. Yeah, and 1,400. One of them just went public. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. Let's see. It's, and and Natura is a large Brazilian company. That yeah. B Corp. And and I'm not saying all B Corps are regenerative, but um, but it just is evidence that the um, that the, the the world the wind is moving, and um, and that doesn't mean if you're trying to start a business it's going to be easy, um, but it's getting easier. Yeah. Hi, I'm Victoria Zellen from New Jersey Pace. And I'm an alum from the second class here at SOM from 79. Um, and I'm just thrilled with your work. Uh, we have a nonprofit that is uh, the Center for Regenerative Community Solutions. And one of the ideas that we were playing with is, uh, could someone design what the world could look like doing, you know, creating regenerative business and all the things that need to happen for the world to work peacefully, um, you know, in the way that we all want. Uh, I think in one of your talks, John, you said all of the great religions of the world share the same values. And while not everybody is religious, I think it kind of stands for human values everywhere are the same. And of course, they're, they're different by culture, but the fundamentals are the same. Have you or anyone in this regenerative space thought about creating a picture of what the world could look like in 2050 mm. to actually create a conversation for the world working. Because right now, people are resigned and cynical that it ever could work and mm. whatever they do, no matter how good, is a drop in the bucket. But you know how the Hunger Project worked back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, was to create a conversation for the end of hunger by the year 2000. And when the Hunger Project started, no one believed that hunger could ever be ended on the planet. It, people were totally resigned and cynical about that. And yet, by the year 2000, and probably in the 1990s, the UN and a lot of, of the global organizations were saying, we have enough. It's a matter of distribution and you know, other kinds of things. Well, we do have enough. And the, the question shifted, you know, how do we feed everyone, given that? But the question of, can we feed everyone on the planet? Can we end hunger? That question's been answered. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that you know, there isn't a future that people can point to and say, I'm going for that. If everyone doing good in their own way were lining up their vision, mission, goals, you know, objectives with some either milestone or the, the farthest future in 2050, why can't we paint that future and create a conversation for mm -hmm. the world working? So I have one. Yeah. So there's a there's a great organization in Boston called Telus Institute, yeah. um, and they have a um, great transition project that's been going on for years, 
and they paint, I think, four scenarios, mm -hmm. four different futures, and it's very much in alignment with what you're describing. And there, there's great conversation that goes on about how would we get to this future. Yes. Um, you know, my, my other reaction or thought on the question is that the, you know, the emergent process to me says that none of us are smart enough to figure that out. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to get clear on the principles and then um, allow, it to, allow it to happen in a way that is a way more complex than any of us could ever figure out. Yeah, and I can see that what you've done uh, from the financial point of view uh, and the economics certainly helps that whole process. You know, if everyone could follow those obvious guidelines, so if that yeah. makes sense, why not? You know, yeah, that I don't know if you have a different thought. Yeah, I, I think the, I can't remember the fellow's name. Is somebody wrote a, a piece in the in the Guardian a couple of years ago called Goodland and talked about examples of all of these different things that represent this kind of regenerative, regenerative economy that are already present. Right. Um, like in Chicago, painting the rooftops white. Uh, uh, our project in, in, in uh, Patagonia would qualify. Uh, some of the uh, com community work that you're doing would qualify. All of, th there are, uh, there are uh, uh, on John's website, the field guide has these 25 examples. And I think we need more of those. I, I think the problem, I, I would agree with John, the problem of that, painting the world in 2050 is it's going gonna, it's gonna to be dumber than the, we might have a, wonder, a more wonderful world in 2050 or a much worse world, but, but I think what we need to do is to be able to illustrate to people who are not necessarily sympathetic to these ideas to picture a world in which those folks, the people who might be on the margins of this, want to live in. And, uh, and showing examples is helpful. Yeah, I, did, I just go back to the question about how do you communicate this with anybody, but also people in finance. You know, our, I, I, I should have said this, our, our real answer to that is to tell stories. And, and we have some really interesting stories that Susan has written in our field guide um, that, you know, rather than walk people through the theory and eight principles that I've, I've forced you all to put up with, show them a story. And it, it kind of changes more at this level than at this level, their understanding. It also makes it less of a fight. Because I think what people resist is um, the idea of a change that will reduce their own stability uh, and their own sense of agency, even if it seems to increase um, the health of, the, uh, of our ecological systems or restore agency and economic health to large numbers of people. I think you have to, you, you, you have to show what the world is going to look like after you do that stuff, and then people decide, oh, yeah, I want in on that, or I want that. No, I don't want that. I, I'd rather live in a gated community and, <laughs> <laughs> and keep the hordes at bay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, Leo Burr, University oh, of Notre, Notre Dame. Leo, I couldn't see you. Hi, John. <laughs> um, congratulations. I think the work is tremendous, and I love your eight principles. And it, it, it's reminiscent of Eleanor Ostrom's eight principles on the commons. And uh, she won the Nobel Prize for that, and so maybe you are a candidate as well. <laughs> How do you see the work of regenerative capitalism uh, building on or using this construct of the commons? Great question. So um, I actually crossed out the partial section in my talk about the commons because it was too long. Um, had I known you were coming, I would have, I would have left it in. Um, so I, I, would, I would say this. I think um, governing the we're in the Anthropocene, we're now in charge, and we need to think about governance in a whole new way. And as Leo, who's an expert at this, uh, one of the real scholars on this could teach us all, um, managing the commons 
is kind of now left to anybody and nobody, um, and it's trapped in the short-term paradigm of business and the short-term paradigm of, of governance and the nation-state paradigm of governance, which is a flawed reductionist concept because commons don't stop at national borders. Um, so, you know, the, the short answer is we need new institutions to manage the commons. Uh, the harder question is how the hell do we do that in the short time frame? Um, and, and again, I don't have, I don't have a plan, but, um, but, but certainly, uh, you know, we have the institution of government, we have the institution of business, we have the institution of the market, we have the institution of um, um, uh, education. We're going to need an equivalent institution that manages the commons at both local and regional scale, as well as in a few instances, global scale, like for example, in carbon. And, and you know, we're not even talking about that at a, at a national level. Um, uh, we're not even talking about putting a tax on carbon yet. Maybe we will in three years. Um, but, um, but my belief is that if we had a different framework to work from, the need for an institution of the commons would become obvious. And so that's why I'm so interested in pushing for this new framework, because without it, I can't imagine a debate between the right and the left in this country about why we need a commons. It just, it'll never happen in the current, current setup. Yeah. Oh, Irene. Irene Clara from New York City, VK Rasmussen Foundation. Um, so back to the question of scale in a five to 10 year term, because with the level of uh, degradation of the environment, that is probably likely what we have. What do you see as the biggest driver in those sort of for, uh, for the principles in a sort of in the practical capitalistic uh, uh, set up is it is it the proven market rate returns on on the on the on the sort of new uh, uh, businesses we're seeing uh, is it uh, uh, is it the divestment movement is there other sort of major drivers for to go to scale you guys are filled with easy questions right <laughs> um, you want to tackle that one first <laughs> while I think a little yeah um, I don't think, I'm afraid that I don't think that there's anything but um, uh, further disruption that will uh, trigger um, large scale awareness or just a kind of, there's a, a famous quote from Sun Also Rises in which one character asks another, says, Mike, how did you go bankrupt? <laughs> and uh, the character says, well, two ways. First, uh, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I think we're all aware that's what's happening. But I also think that awareness um, can come about uh, gradually and then suddenly. And that what we're probably the best we can hope for at this point is the kind of realization of the environmental and social crisis that you had around 1970 when uh, everybody recognized that the air was polluted and that the Cuyahoga River was on fire. You need that kind of um, a shared understanding or agreement, I think, for people to start to talk about action at scale. Until then, I think all of the stuff that's happening on a smaller scale is really significant. All of the environmental um, uh, legis <laughs> the most important environmental work is in the past 15 years has been done on a regional level uh, while uh, in the United States while the, gov the national government has been so uh, deadlocked. So I'm not sure that's a satisfactory answer, but that's what I would see. Yeah, I, I put my oar in the water for the lots of small, um, as much as we want a silver bullet. You know, Paul Hawken is working on a project called Project Drawdown, which I just learned about recently, and he's focused exclusively on the carbon question. Um, and the issues I've talked about are well beyond climate change and carbon. But um, he's tried to quantify all of the things we need to do 
to get to drawdown, meaning drawdown of carbon out of the atmosphere. And it turns out he's got a list, you know, three pages long, where the biggest one is rotational grazing, hmm. but the biggest one is tiny. There's hundreds of little things that we need to do. Now, the cool thing about that is it's very empowering. Pick one. Run with it. You know, read the report. It's, it's this long of stuff you can work on, and all of it matters. And if we don't do all of it, we don't get to drawdown. So in many ways, you know, it's this diversity of activity that's needed to shift as opposed to a top-down silver bullet, one policy. Um, but having said that, we got to come up with a few key policies. Like, you know, obviously putting a price on carbon wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, but I don't know how to do that. The other thing, and you know this, but the, you know, we've made a big bet at Capital Institute that storytelling is central to this whole change strategy and, and for the reasons that, that Vincent mentioned. And so uh, it, it doesn't sound as powerful, but good storytelling, um, I think, is a, is a big piece of it. Frank. Hi, John. Frank Werner from Fordham University. Um, again, let me join with everybody in thanking you for being here. I've heard this story in its earlier forms several times. and <laughs> Helps figure it out. It's lovely to see it coming together so nicely. Uh, there were some comments about how finance is going to change. And I'm a professor of finance at Fordham University. What I see happening... Can I just say one thing before you make your comment? Frank is one of the few finance professors I've met in my life who get this and are intrigued by this and are working on this inside a mainstream finance department. So Thank you. And, and it's frustrating you that, that. that there aren't many others who see it. Uh, but I do think that the, the, one of the ways in which this is going to happen is because your generation, the, the folks here in the room that are students, gets it far more than my generation or even younger folk like John. Uh, what I see at Fordham is an incredible desire from students to improve the world. Now, maybe that's the Jesuit Catholic environment, uh, which I suspect you also see at Notre Dame, uh, non-Jesuit but Catholic, but value-based education. But what I see happening is that my students, and, and even those students that I don't have, and I teach a course in sustainability and finance directly, are constantly asking what they can be doing to make the world a better place. And so this is all part of the slower changes that you said, but I think it's going to happen. And it's going to happen because more and more financial managers are going to turn over and are going, the existing managers, the existing uh, Wall Street people are going to be bit by bit replaced with people whose values are aligned with what needs to happen and who see the emerging opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic based upon what I see, even though it's very frustrating that it's going to take far too long for it to happen. Um, just to add to your point, work, working at Patagonia, until about 10 years ago, there was no way we could draw anyone from a conventional education, either an MBA from a big school or someone in textiles from Duke or uh, University of North Carolina, without uh, having to socialize them in some way to our attitude about sustainability and to reducing environmental harm. It just wasn't part of the education. It wasn't part of people's job backgrounds. That's simply no longer true. So that everybody who comes to us now, both from early, an early career and also from a major school, shares this language, which is, which is significant. Because it's, uh, if you don't have that language, you're not likely to consider that in the framework of your real work. It's likely to be considered something you think about after 6 o'clock instead of how do I change, in, in the course of my work day, change what I do that makes, and make a difference. Should we call it a night? Yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming and would uh, welcome you to uh, join me in thanking both John and Vincent in joining us today.